Joining us tonight for the interview, I'm very happy to say, is Senator James Inhofe, the ranking Republican on the Environment and Public Works Committee. Senator Inhofe, thank you so much for being here. I'm really happy that you were able to be here tonight. Well, Rachel, you won't believe this, but I'm happy to be here with you. <laughs> when, I, when I talk about all those investigations, uh, clearing the scientists and the university, and I talk about the general consensus on what happened with ClimateGate being, being very different from your consensus, do you feel you know, like let, let, I'm part of the hoax? Do you feel like I'm being misled? <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, you talked about Fox News and some of the right wing, as you referred to them. Let me talk to you about some of the left wing and how they responded to it. This climate gate was a big deal. Hold on just a minute now. You got to listen to this. Uh, the UK Telegraph, that's one of the biggest ones in London. They said it's the worst scientific scandal of our generation. The uh, Financial Times said the stink of intellectual corruption is overpowering. The IPCC prominent, uh, this is one that actually came from the United Nations was a fraud on a scale I've never seen before. The uh, UN scientist, and this guy's Dr. Philip Lloyd, called it the fraud a result is not scientific. Newsweek finally changed their position and came out and was condemning it. I mean, you can't find anyone who's whitewashing this thing except you. Wait, hold We're on, but I, I, these... I don't have an opinion on it though. What I was citing was the University of East Anglia, the British House of yeah. Commons, the Penn yeah. State investigation, and the American yeah. government's investigation. And everyone you it. named was someone investigating themselves. Well, but the, the what University is different of East here Anglia is did these hire are external a, researchers to do it. It was nobody from the university. They hired an internal, an external, independent investigative unit to look into it. Do you think that East Anglia was corrupt? They were associated with East Anglia and these organizations here. These are news organizations. Quite frankly, three of the five that I read were very much on the liberal side of this issue for a long period of time. The Telegraph? But, you know, so instead of you and me talking about what our opinion is, let's look and see what the, the media who studied this is. Well, uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, I'd say the UK Telegraph, that's the first one I mentioned. And that, they that's talk the about, most conservative paper in, in Britain. You know how we have partisan TV well, they got here a serious and they have problem non, over there. They if have that's non partisan the most conservative paper in Britain, that's a, uh, they've got other problems too. I think. They have non partisan news on TV in Britain, but they have really partisan papers. And the Telegraph and is the, the most right wing of all the British papers. The Financial and the Times, I believe. Intellectual also, corruption is overpowering. Would you say the same thing about the Financial Times? Well, the finance, I mean, if I'm, whatever you think about the Financial Times, I think saying that liberals have decided that climate gate was real too is an overstatement. I mean, I think the British no, House of Commons looking into it sort of matters more than what conservative papers in England think about it. Right? You know, when this thing came out, the appropriate thing about this, uh, you may not have remembered, uh, Rachel, is that I asked the question of Lisa Jackson, by the way, you and Lisa Jackson and Barbara Boxer are my three favorite liberals because uh, I enjoy watching you very much. Lisa, she even has a picture of my 20 kids and grandkids hanging on her wall. So he, she and I get along fine. I asked her the question before I left for Copenhagen. I said, you know, I have a feeling as soon as I get out of town, you're going to have an endangerment uh, finding so that you can regulate the very thing that you could not pass legislatively. And that's cap and trade. She kind of smiled. And then I said, when this happens, what science are you going to use? And she said, well, of course, the IPCC. Now, that's what we've been talking about here. Everything that is coming out in terms of regulation, or I should say over-regulation, is going to be predicated on this science. And this is the serious problem that we have. By the way, when I talk about the cost of this thing, back during the time that we were looking at Kyoto, then we had the McCain-Lieberman bill, we had all these uh, cap and trade bills, the cost is, is to the American taxpayers would be between three and four hundred billion dollars a year. Now, Rachel, if you look at that, go back to what I thought was the, it, it was the biggest tax increase in three decades, the Clinton-Gore tax increase of 1993. This would be 10 times that great. Can, so can, that's can what I, got, you know, do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I was chairing that committee and I first heard about this? I thought it must be true until I found out what it cost. When I started questioning the science, our phone was ringing off the hook in my office in Washington by scientists who said that they were, they were rejected from the process because they didn't agree with the conclusion. So, okay, let me so ask, I say it's yeah, a rigged deal. Yeah. Well, it, it, here's, here's one issue that I had with your book and I think with your overall approach to the issue. You, you take small anecdotes and you extrapolate to the broader conclusion that there is no, no global warming. For example, you, you write that in the past, in the 1970s, the media wrote scary stories about uh, a coming ice age. And you use that oh, as, yeah. Yeah, as a data point to point out that there, to, to prove that there is no global warming today because the media was wrong before and so there is no global warming today. Or, or you write that not all scientists agree 
that there is global warming happening, and that's true. But something like 97% of scientists in relevant fields do agree. And so you're right, they don't no, all no, agree, but not. they mostly do. And you never, you never, that you never true, concede Rachel. that in your arguments. You know, I, you say something over and over again, and sooner or later, people, particularly your audience, there's a liberal audience, they want to believe it. Except for me, I watch you all the time. I want to see what the other side's doing. But this 97%, that doesn't mean anything. I named literally thousands of scientists on the floor. Well, I didn't name them all by name, but I had them on a website people could refer to. And these are top people. And I know that you get tired of hearing from uh, Richard Lindzen from MIT, but he's the guy that was talking about the severity of this. He said, cap and trade or global warming is a, regulating cap and trade is a bureaucrat's dream. If you regulate carbon, you regulate life. And, the, uh, and so I'd have to tell you, I know you disagree with this, and I know that uh, uh, Larry Combs disagrees with this because I had an interview with him. But that's, in my opinion, what it's all about. Okay. Well, I, I, the only the only point that I would say is I think that your I think that your argument would be stronger if you don't make it try to make it seem like all scientists are on your side on this. Most scientists aren't on your side, and you've done a good well, job know, highlighting the ones argument, that are. And, but, but you do have to concede be, that numerically more people are on the other side, and so I that's think that's not true. It's not true. You don't think they, that they, more everyone scientists believes that because it all came agree. from the the, um, the IPCC. And again, I hope if you read the book, have you read the book? I have read the book. I've read the whole Did thing. You, did you read the whole thing on the United Nations? Yeah, I read the whole thing. Uh, how, okay, and that's it, fine. I got I I, I got to say uh, that when let, let me let me let me bring up one other thing. Mm -hmm. You joke in your book that w when people ask you how much of your campaign contributions uh, come from the energy industry, you answer not enough. Which is, a, which is a very funny answer. And your top three donors are Coke Industries, a big part of their business is petroleum refining, uh, Murray Energy, a coal company, um, and Devon Energy, which is an oil and natural gas company. Oh, they're, they're a great group, too. Well, why uh, would, let me, why, let me, wait, on, wait, let me just you. ask you a question. Why mm -hmm. wouldn't a reasonable person learn that about you and assume well, that I, your anti-global warming, pro-fossil fuel stance is because, sort of just what your donors are paying for? Because we hear things about big oil. Well, what you name there is not all that big of oil, but that doesn't really make any difference. There's an article that you would love, and I dare say you haven't seen it yet. It was in Nature magazine, a very, a very liberal uh, uh, publication, or a publication on your side. And they talk about this thing from American University, and they analyze. They say, why is it that we on the global warming side are not winning? We're spending more money. We have the, the, the media on our side, eight to 10 and 80% of the media is on our side, and yet we're losing. Then they go into the detail as to how much money actually comes out. Did you know, and I dare say a lot of your guys that are uh, on your program, uh, in, in your camp, don't realize that the environmentalist groups raised, and this is in a period of the 2009, uh, uh, 2010, 1.7 billion, as a pro opposed to the other side, 900 million. So you're talking about spending twice as much money. And that's so when you, I you when think I, that the environmental about, groups have more money to spend on this issue than the entire energy absolutely. industry? Absolutely. The well, energy industry the, is the poor you get the move, You get the moveon.org, the George Soros, the Michael Moores, wow. the, all the Hollywood elites and all your good friends out there. Yeah, they sure do. I, I would put Michael hey, Moore up against article. Exxon on this any day. Hey, they, they, hey, hey Rachel, <laughs> yeah. honey, that, that, this is in their article. Okay. Uh, and, and again, it, it's pretty well documented, so I suggest you read that. That was in uh, I, maybe the most recent uh, copy. Anyway, it's about the uh, study that was done by American University. So <clears throat> you can use the argument, but you know, that assuming that you're bought and paid for. All I want to do in energy is be self-sufficient, Rachel. We have more recoverable reserves than any country in the world. We have more than any country in, in coal, oil, and gas. We could be completely self-sufficient from the Middle East just with our, with Canada, Mexico, and us in a very short period of time. We're the only country in the world that doesn't exploit our own resources. Now, you heard the, the today the president made a, a speech we talked about. He wants all of the above and all that. But again, he uh, when it gets right down to it, I'm sure that upsets a lot of your people out there. Well, but uh, in, in, he really doesn't. He, he has fought this 
tooth and nail fo uh, fossil oil, fuels. Oil production has for gone four up. Years. Oil production has gone up under President Obama uh, compared yes, to what has. it was under President Bush. Which, Absolutely. Which we can and there's agree a good on. reason for that because of all the new shale findings that are there. Look so, at but the talking about him as a guy who's stopping production, it's just not true. No, no. Look, look at all in in uh, it, right? where you I normally mean, don't it, expect it in Cal in uh, uh, New York, in Pennsylvania, the Marcellus there. But, all the opportunities. We have a guy named Harold Ham who's up right now in North Dakota. Sir, He's from Enid, Oklahoma. I, I, He's the largest producer up there now. You know, his biggest problem is. His biggest problem is they, they're fully employed. They can't find anyone to work. So Sir, anyone but, wa let, talk, you, watching this right now. The point that you now, make here is that President Obama is blocking production and doesn't want us to be production, producing energy. Energy production, oil production in particular, is up under President Obama versus President Bush. So making this, this a problem with President Obama doesn't make any sense, no matter what anybody in well, North it makes, Dakota Well, it makes sense because these fines took place. They were it really into the oil sands the way they are now. So, and that's what has made. When I say that we could run the United States of America at present consumption for 90 years on uh, natural gas and 60 years for, on, on oil, that's true today. If we were having this conversation two months from now, it would probably be 110 years in, in 80 years because of what's going on out there. But that's in spite of the president. The president, <laughs> the president will tell you that he's done everything he can to yeah. stop fossil fuels, hadn't he? Well, and they've gone up under him. Senator Inhofe, I know you are a free market capitalist, so you'll understand that we have to take a commercial break for a second. Yep. Do you mind sticking around? I'd love to. All right. Thank you. Uh, Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, when we come back, just a moment.